today we are going to continue on the church I see. And the church I see fellowships together. The believers meet often for prayer, encouragement, studying the word of God and accountability. Together we're stronger. Uh, I got to try over here. Together we are stronger. Well, we know where the anointed section is this morning. It's okay. Yeah. In Hebrews 10, as we read earlier, verse 24 and 25, you know, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that they, the day of his return is drawing near. So we're working today on, I wanna, we want to talk to you about engagement. And how many of you, I mean, realistically, how many of you like to eat? The rest of you are either lying. <laughs> so here's how this works. You can talk about food. How many know you can talk about food? You can even go sit at a table where there's food present. But does that benefit you? When does the food benefit you? When you engage in the process and you actually take some of that food and put it into your mouth. Recently, I was blessed with the opportunity to have some prime rib, perfectly cooked. You know, I took a little piece of that, but it was great looking at it, but it wasn't until I engaged in the process and took a piece and put it into my mouth and it started to melt <laughs> that I was actually partaking and, and fully participating and fully engaging. The same is true within our local congregation of believers. You can talk about church and you can talk about Jesus. You can even show up and sit, but it's the people that engage most fully in the process that are gonna absorb the most out of the experience. And, and this is what we're gonna be uh, talking to you a little about with that whole motivated to love and motivated to good works. So today I'm thrilled to have Pastor Rick up here with me. So why don't you come now and you can start. Good morning, good morning WCF. A treat and honor to be here in the greatest church on the whole planet, amen. And uh, we travel a lot. Kathy and I have been in 12 cities in the last seven weeks and six weeks. And all I can say is we got the greatest worship team, the greatest helps ministry, the greatest everything, amen? Because you guys have put God number one in your lives and we're so honored to be here, amen? So our job, Pastor RJ and Mary have asked me to speak this morning and uh, to be a part of this and it's a real honor. And it's really the church that he sees. See, when God shares a heavenly vision, the Apostle Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. We recognize that the word vision literally has four elements in it. And the number one element that the word vision has is to see. The actual word for word literally means to see, and it says God sees. And the way God sees things is a little bit different than oftentimes we see things, and the way God sees one another is a little bit different than the way we oftentimes see one another. And so I want to just develop it from that there standpoint. So it's the ability to see what it is that God sees. When Abraham was given this here charge in Genesis 13, he said, after Lot was gone, the Lord said to Abraham, look, as far as you can see in every direction, I'm going to give you all this land to you and to your offspring as a permanent possession, and I'm going to give you so many descendants that like dust, they cannot be counted. Later in Genesis 15, 4, he said, the Lord brought Abraham outside beneath the night sky and told him, look up into the heavens and count the stars. If you can, your descendants will be like that, too many to count. We could see that Jesus said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So we could see the importance of the vision. And I believe it's brilliant for Pastor RJ and Mary in their first tender here now as lead in the lead role to cast the heavenly vision of the church that they see to mobilize every part. How many know none of us are called to be spectators in the church? We're all called to be participants in the church. And I want to zero in on that. When Nehemiah had a heavenly 
heavenly vision. You can read that in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. And you'll see about the vision that God actually gave to him in prayer in the time of fasting. But how many know that in chapter 2 he got all the resources that he needed. But in chapter 3 he was able to mobilize the entire nation together to fight, to work, to serve, and to bring the project together. And so every person that said, you'll see the word in the New King James repaired, I believe it's some 28 times, and it's a corresponding action to what they had, the vision, and then every part doing their part. In the same respect, we need to understand that God looks at his church today, and how many know he's not coming back for a divided church, he's coming back for a united church? He's coming back for a glorious church. Come on. A church without spot and wrinkle. Now, how's that going to happen? Well, God wants us to lift our sights up and to see things the way that he sees things. Until you see you're righteous, you'll never live a righteous life. Until you see that you're dedicated, you'll never live a dedicated life. Until you see that you're forgiven, you will always live with condemnation. Until you see yourself the way that God sees you, which is different than oftentimes the way you see yourself, because your identity is not in uh, the shamateros that I was raised in. Our identity now is in Christ. Amen? And so God... Gideon saw himself as a weakling. Gideon saw himself as a failure. Gideon saw himself inferior. Gideon saw himself as the least in his father's house, but God saw him as a mighty man, a warrior, and a champion. And how many know some things happened in his life that brought him uh, up into the place where the angel of the Lord actually visited him? And how many know he stepped up and believed what God had said about him was more real than all the identity of his past? And when he broke into that, God made him the champion that he was. In the same respect, God even prophetically changes names. We can see Simon, uh, Simon, who was one of the 12 apostles. We know him as Peter today, but his literal name was Simon. And Jesus changed his name from Simon uh, the reed, the tumbleweed, the one that's just bouncing around, the one that's always speaking out of place and turn to the rock, okay, the fortified one. And so we see this in the word of God. The way God sees us is different than how we see ourselves. So I want to tie it in this morning into the church and how that fleshes out in a very, very practical way, amen? Now, we read the verses this morning about not forsaking the assembling together as the manner of some is, are not neglecting the assembling together as the manner of some is. If you could put the text up there in the book of Hebrews 11. Now, I've learned this here over many, many years. Putting people on guilt trips is not going to change them. Amen. 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 Telling people why, why, why you need to be in church and just, tell, you know, you need to be in church, you need this and that. Just telling them is not going to change them. But what I've learned in life is that oftentimes we do things that is impossible in the natural because God is prompting us to do things. An example of that would be David and Goliath. We know for 40 days, Goliath came out every day and he taunted in disdain and mocked the children of Israel. And the top army officials were all full of fear because of what he did for 40 years, for 40 days. The devil paints pictures inside of our minds and he doesn't do it over a week. He doesn't do it over a month. He does it over sometimes decades inside of our lives of inferiority, of rejection. And he paints these here pictures in our mind. Just like God wants to paint a heavenly vision, the enemy often paints a picture. And it's really disgusting with our culture today how there's such a disdain towards men today. And men are look like that they're weak. Men are look like they're inferior. And, 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 and they, they, we build the women up that they're the strong ones and everything else. Come on. And not against strong women. But the reality is men are not weaklings. Men have a God. Men have a God-given gifting inside of them. Listen, to be the giant slayers of the day, to be the champions of the day, to be the overcomers that God has called them to be, to be the winners, to be the champions, to be the heroes. God has put that on the inside. So the culture is trying to paint a, vic a, a figure and a vision of men that goes contrary to what God's word has to say. So as men, we need to rise up against that thing. Amen. So here's what I've learned is that God said, let us not neglect. Whenever you see the word neglect, it is usually never in a positive connotation. So if somebody neglects their personal appearance, 
Okay, and they let themselves go. That's neglect. If somebody neglected their children, or if somebody neglected their, ho- their husband, or they neglected their wife, it's usually a terminology that is always used in a negative way. And so God says, let us not neglect, come on, our meeting together as some people do. But then he says, but, a conjunction that brings the two together, but encourage one another. So instead of neglect... God says, encourage one another. Now listen, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So how many know from when Paul, whoever the writer was that wrote that, Paul was one of the ones that possibly could have, but whoever wrote that, when they wrote it 2,000 years ago, how many know the day of the Lord is closer today, the return of the Lord is closer today than it was 2,000 years ago? And so he says, there's an important reason why I want you to be together. And this is what Pastor R.G. and Mary are sharing on the church that they see. And I'm going to give you this morning some benefits of why the church that they see needs to be together. Is that all right? Okay. Now, is there anybody here that would like to live a longer life? hundred hands maybe in the whole place. Okay. How many want to live a long life? I've been there with people when they're in their deathbed. I've been there with people in their last day. I've been there, and I've never, very, very seldom have I ever heard, I just want to go until it's usually too late, but, but usually people want to hang on as long as they can to every minute, to every breath. That's just the within inside of us. But listen to this here from the New York Times on April 20th, 2013, an article, and how many know that's a newspaper? Now, I'm not going to call it fake news or real news. I'm not going to get into any debates on that. But it's a newspaper with journalists that come in, and they're bringing documentation now of scientific proof and evidence. And this is what they said. One of the most striking scientific discoveries about religion in recent years is that going to church, everybody say going to church. And he said this here, the writer of the, uh, his name is T.M. Litterman, going to church weekly is good for you. Religious attendance, at least religiosity, boosts the immune system and decreases your blood pressure. And it may add as much as two to three years to your life. And the reason for this is not entirely clear. So in other words, they're saying, we don't understand how this whole thing works, but the reality is it does work, and it does bring an immune system, it does help your blood pressure, and it does cause you to live longer. Well, how many know before the New York Times ever came on the scene, God was on the scene? Now listen to this one from Saskatchewan, okay? Significantly, uh, statistics benefits for those who attend church regularly. Now listen. Significantly lower risk of depression. I'll say it again. Significantly lower risk of depression. Not from a preacher. Not from a minister of the gospel. But researchers at the University of Saskatchewan found that the incidence of clinical depression was 22% lower among those who attended religious services at least once a month compared with those who never attend. So listen, listen, if you're just a monthly one that just checks in once a month, you're 22% better than the others. But let me tell you, what would happen if you ended up going every week? It can go from 22 to 44 to 88% better of depression. They tell us, and they're all over the room today, the psychiatrist, that some four out of 10 Canadians are suffering with mild to severe depression. Now you understand why God says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to call upon his name. Now you understand why the Bible says enter into his gates with thanksgiving and come into his courts with praise for the Lord is good. His unfailing love is forever and his mercy endures forever. Now you can understand why how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious anointing oil that ran down the beard of Aaron. It's like the dew that came came down Mount Hermon, and he said, there it is that God commands his blessing in life evermore. There's benefits to coming to church. Number two, 
How many struggle with not enough hours in the day? Come on. How many have ever said that? There's just not enough hours in the day to get everything done. Well, there's an answer. Better time management for those who attend church. People who attend church have better ability to manage time and achieve their goals. Uh, this is from a report from Freeman from 1985. And they said perhaps it's because maybe they follow God who calls them to redeem the time. And then he also, church attendance has a direct effect on reducing deviant behavior such as drug use, violence, and delinquency among at-risk youth uh, from the Fagan study that they did in 2006. So they'll have better time management and they'll have better use and opportunities of their time because they're going to be able to seize the opportunities that are there because they took time for God. Amen. And then number three, listen to this one, better grades. These, this is research. This is re it, it, said, it said better grades and higher education prospect. Church attendance is correlated with higher math reading, reading scores, and greater education aspiration from a regenerous 2000 poll. And the church attendees are more likely to complete homework and degree programs. Amen. In other words, they're just not going to start them, but they're going to finish those their things. And church attendance is why. Oh, listen to this here one. Significantly lower risk of death. Longer life expectancy. Don't get me wrong. The death rate amongst Christians right now, to the best of my research, to the best of my study, to everything I've ever checked, is 100%. So how many know we're all going to die? Okay, so don't think I'm not preaching something that, that we're not all going to die, okay? Now, the rapture thing's another whole thing, but we'll leave that for another day, amen? There's been many before me that believe that we we're going to be raptured out, okay? But the reality is, but apparently, some people live longer, and this is the research. Those who go to church more than once a week enjoy even better health than those who attend only once a week. Research, overall, the reduction in mortality attributable to church going is 25%, a huge amount in epidemiological studies. And once again, researchers, that's a long word for me to pronounce, okay? And once again, researchers thought that perhaps this was simply due to having strong, supportive relationships. So that's what they thought, just the relationships in the church. But non-church-centered groups didn't experience the same effect. Nor did people of worldviews other than Judeo-Christian, okay, uh, and I got all these professors and all these ones that did this here, from the religion and spirituality to physical health, American psychiatrists study in 2003 as quoted in Loneliness Chapter, page 261. The last one is, okay, anybody married here? About half you, okay, anyway. But anyway, better sex lives. A recent University of Chicago study known as the most comprehensive and methodologically sound sex survey ever conducted found a dramatically higher rates of the big O in women who attend church services religiously. It said, thus was echoed, listen to it here, by a 1940 Stanford University study. No wonder there was church growth in 1940. Back then, 98% of all Canadians were actually in church back then. Okay, and then listen to this here. It says, and a study in 1970 by Red Book Magazine, the survey all found higher levels of sexual satisfaction among women who attend religious services religiously. Come on now. Okay, and that's all in the revenge of the church lady. Come on, usatoday.com. Glory to God, there's benefits in coming to church. Can you say amen? God doesn't just say not forsaking to seven together as a matter of some is, but all the more so as the day of the Lord approaches and I'll be right back. <laughs> so starting this week, we're going to be at church services every single day this week. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. In Acts chapter 2. 
All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. Now watch this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So there's some doctrine that's come forth here about forsaking not the assembly of yourselves together. Also, our motive for everything that we do should be what? Love and? Good work. Someone said it. Love and good works. That's Hebrews 10, 24. The motivation for what we do is love, and the motivation for what we do is doing good works, good service. So we've got love, we've got good works that motivate us to do what? To join together in community together. And we are doing the best we can to give you lots of opportunities to participate in community here at our church. I talked about a couple of them already. I talked about Sunday night, where we have prayer, a corporate prayer time, 6 to 8 o'clock. But you say that's a long time to pray. You're right, it's a long time to pray. So come from 6 to 7, or come from 7 to 8, or come from 6.15 to 6.30. How about Wednesday night? I think I talked about that too, another opportunity to engage with us. We mentioned some of the classes that we have. We mentioned the service that we have. On Thursday night, we have all kinds of activities here. We have REACH. We have Celebrate Recovery. We have a men's team that meets through our Men Alive ministry. I think there might be others. Yeah, we have the Saturday morning men's team. We have mentor groups that meet in people's houses. And you're going to hear more about that starting in the new year. We're going to start activating more mentor groups and give you more opportunities to meet house to house as they did in the, in the biblical. And then we have meetings in the corporate body, the corporate assembly together. We have a youth group that meets on Friday nights. Any youth? Come on. You're all out. <laughs> Young too, Sean. <laughs> Not quite there anymore. I have youth in my home, <laughs> too. <laughs> but see, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship. How about this one? Sharing in meals. Did you ever eat with people? You know that we're close if I'm eating with you. <laughs> You're close to people that you eat with, or you can be. That's how you develop a relationship over the table when you eat. This is engaging. The Lord's Supper, which we'll do in a few minutes, and a prayer, which we just talked about. But it says, what does it say in the next verse? A deep sense of awe came over all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I'm going to tell you something. When corporate bodies of believers engage in the process together, in doctrine and prayer and in practice, you're going to see the signs and wonders released inside of your life because it creates an atmosphere with gratefulness. See, we've been talking about creating an atmosphere inside of our lives, an atmosphere of love, an atmosphere of thanksgiving, an atmosphere of what? We've got to be engaged in the process, fully engaged. It's not just participating, but it's being fully engaged in the process. Right. How many of you ever seen that, uh, that viral video that talked about the, uh, the officer that was directing traffic, but they just really enjoyed their job and they sat there and danced? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, you guys have seen that one. That man was engaged in the process. Yeah. He was fully committed to what he was doing, and you know what? He had a lot of fun. To be honest, life's way too short not to have fun. We need to enjoy every day with Christ. So when we're here, when we're engaged in the process, that means find the area that God wants you to serve, but just embrace it, love it, own it, participate in it. And God has called every one of us to engage in the process. So as we do that, we have to engage in prayer. We talk to God and we let God talk to us. We engage in the word of God. We read the word, we study the word, and we activate it. I was talking a little bit earlier today. God has given us his armor. And we're supposed to put it on. What do you put on your feet? Yeah, you were blessed out of your socks at the Sovereign, weren't you, bro? <laughs> but here's the thing. When we're talking in the context of Ephesians 6, the armor of God, what do we put on our feet? Peace. What do we put about our, 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 our waist? 
breastplate of? Oh, you guys remember this. Helmet of? Shield of? You want to preach with me? <laughs> You're right. Sword of the Spirit. But what's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. If you never spend any time reading the Word, what kind of weapon do you have to fight against the forces of darkness? If you just put on all of your defensive gear, you're going to feel like that one kid where everybody else has a dodgeball on this side and that kid's on the other side and everybody's throwing the dodgeball at him. Can you say target practice for the enemy? You need your, you need your sword. And the sword is twofold. It's the word of God and it's prayer. And when you start activating the word of God in your life and you start activating prayer in your life, that's when we go to war against the enemy and that's our offensive weapon that we can use as we engage in the process. Some people are content to come in, they put on their armor and they sit down and then they wonder why they get beat up a lot. <laughs> oh, I tried Jesus, I tried church, it's just not working for me. Well, you can only half engage in the process. You need to pull out the word of God and start applying it to your life that God has not given me fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. And we start applying the word of God to our life and we start going to war against the enemy and we uproot the lies that he's placed inside of us. This is engaging the process. We allow the word of God to change us from the inside out. I know Pastor Rick has more to say. Come on up here, Pastor. <laughs> Pastor RJ, this is fun. Yeah. Amen. It is. Telling people why they need to go to church. I know, hey. Can I, but can these, I, we're preaching to the choir today. Just a question. Was dad and mom an example of actually going to church? Uh, let's see. I would guess that you guys probably spent a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 70 hours in the church on a weekly basis. So, yeah. So at least once I think, a week. I think you were engaged in, in, in church. Okay. So the rest I could say is all working. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, but you were here. The, the benefits, okay? Oh, the benefits, yeah, yeah. Okay. You went to church a lot. Listen to this here. This is a good one, Art. Jesus went back to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual... Remember it says in the New King, as his custom was, which yes. means habit. Yes. He went to the meeting places, what the message it says. Yeah. The meeting place was the synagogue. So he actually had a habit of actually going, going to, to the synagogue. Yeah. That's Even pretty Jesus. cool. Pardon? Even Jesus, when he was there, went to church. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that cool? Yeah. And then, okay, it says in Hebrews 10, 25, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship. Yeah. So that means it's, it, it only takes, it only takes, they say, 21 to 28 days to make a habit to make a habit good or bad good or bad okay so just a question so so if somebody actually they say ah, you know i'm just tired i'm just gonna stay home okay and then the kids say well i want to go to church well dad's tired today but today everybody's here because we got an extra hour of sleep amen and there was even more people at the 9 a.m. than yes. at the 11. There was a few that showed up really early. They were here like at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay. Okay. But just a question over here. So, so it says they got out of the habit. So how can they actually form a good habit? So if the average person in church goes twice every month in Essex County, and that's what they say. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay, and I've talked to a lot of my friends in their churches all throughout here, and they say the average Christian is going two out of four weeks a month. The average, that's what it is. So if that's true, and then a bump comes up, shower comes up, a wedding comes up, and that's three weeks. I got this, another whole line of statistics, why people, how to minister to the unchurched, but why the unchurched became the unchurched. And 20 Two percent of them said they never planned on it. Just kind of happened. Life just kind of happened. And so, so that's one, almost one out of four. It just happened. They, they got busy and then they just stopped going. And then over a period of that habit was formed after three to four weeks. And then that's happened. We have to be intentional in faith. There, there it is. To say, God, I'm going to put you first in my life, and because of that, I'm going to be in church. Right. 
Amen. Amen. That's good, Art. That's, that's all. So, it is a positive example going to church is a positive example. When you go each Sunday, you're setting an example. You're setting an example that other people notice. It's an example that becomes an inspiration for other people. And people who are trying to make their lives better, people who want a positive change, are going to be impacted by your example of someone who is committed to regular church attendance. Now, let me, let me just state this here. One of the things that I know Pastor RJ and Mary are really working, and that Pastor Kathy and I have worked in the past, is to always make everything we do at WCF life-giving. We're not just talking about going to church because you have to go to church. We're talking about engagement in church, not just being on the sidelines because what we've learned is, and if you knew how many men that I work with, okay, in the church now, even out of my role, that, that actually are able to already train and equip that I turn people over to them and bring that one over to that one and give this person this assignment, give that... And then they're using their gift. And what I've recognized is, is that all of us have to have some form of engagement. Amen? And, and this is huge. And then that not only is it important for fellowship to come in. Fellowship is huge. It says they broke bread together. They went to the word of God. They prayed together. Do you, do you, do you know what, how many times in the New Testament in the book of Acts... It says, and they prayed. And then it says, and God did something. Every time you study that out, I think it's 28 times in the book of Acts, it said, and they, the, the corporate church prayed, and then God did something. Amen? Now, let me, just, let me just state this here. How many enjoyed the life-giving worship this morning? Come on, how many entered in? Amen? And, you know, to me, it's not even about, it's, it's not even about the style of the songs, but it's life-giving when... I see musicians that are passionate, and I see singers that are passionate. It's just, man, that passion is what just draws me in. And, and, and there's a connection. So, so in the ministry, the most important thing that we got over to Pastor R.G. and Mary is the importance of the Word of God, and that's what we're sharing, how this Word will change us. Amen? Now, here's one of the greatest benefits of why we come to church. Go with you, if you will to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and back up one before to, uh, to 24, I think it is, in verse number 24. And you got to get it, okay? Now, here's what he says before he says not neglecting. It said, let us think of ways to motivate one another. Come on, to what? To acts of love and good works. So, so how many know if somebody gets out of love, then how many know our responsibility as believers is to motivate or encourage them. Come on. One translation literally uses the word provoke them. And it means incite them to action, to love, and to good works. So all of us have people that we come in contact with every day that are stuck in the ruts of life. There's people you may work with. There's people that you may uh, work at the, on the line with. There are people that you may employ. or people that uh, you work with in the, uh, in, in the field out there, wherever it might be, that are stuck from a betrayal, stuck from a hurt, stuck from a painful experience, stuck in, in some area of their life. And our job as believers is to come alongside them and encourage them. Listen, listen, I've watched you. I care about you, but you're stuck. All you're doing is rehearsing and nursing what happened 30 years ago. And you know what? I got a place we can hang out. I got a place we can go to uh, that you can get free of that there. Oh, really? Where's that? You know, like <laughs> church. Oh, really? You know? And, and, and you know what? I'm going to come by and I'm going to take you to church. You know what happens? God comes on them and they recognize their sinfulness outside of Christ. And they realize that the things that they have done to other people also. And then God gets his forgiveness in there. Isn't that powerful? Yes. And so think of ways. I want to ask the whole church today, what ways, what are you thinking about today how you can motivate other people to love and to good works? What are you, what are you thinking about today? How you can motivate them to love and good works. You know what I've learned is that the enemy is uh, 
a real master. And he brings distractions into our lives or he brings little things into our lives that are so really insignificant, but he uses those things and magnifies them into our minds. And then we use excuses why we don't engage, why we don't get involved. I believe that every course, Karen right now, who's on baptism, is actually got a class. It's a new one. This, and it's just on a book of the Bible, the Song of Solomon. And there's no more seats in the class. Because people have engaged and people are hungry and people are coming in. All of us struggle in areas of mind renewal that's going on. And we're trying at times to change your behavior. And the Bible says you'll never change your behavior till you change the way you think about that behavior. You know, there was a flea uh, study that they did on fleas. And they put the fleas in a pan, in, in a pot. And it was a tall pot. And they put them in and these things were just jumping. Okay, the fleas. And then they put a lid on top of the fleas. And they jumped and they hit that lid and they hit that lid and they hit that lid and they hit that lid. And then basically in their mind, the fleas said, there's no way that I'm going to get out of this pot. So there's no reason to even try. And they took the lid off after the experiment and the fleas never jumped up out of that pot. And it's the way many believers are today. There's lids of limitations that have been put on your life. And it could come from good-meaning people. It could come from family members. But those lids are inside your life. And there's courses that are mind renewal that will change the way you think. Like you've heard me say this a hundred times. The elephant, they would tie a rope around it when it's a baby. And then they, they bring it out to the circus and the, the elephant's out there. But then that elephant grows and it pulls against that rose and pulls again. And it can't do anything as a baby to get free of that thing. Pole, stake, rope means limitations in our lives. And all of us have these limitations in our life that God wants to break us out into another dimension in. And now that elephant is grown. Now that elephant is tall. Now that elephant is an incredible beast of strength. But it won't because its mind is set in a way. And there's a mind renewal course that goes on that can change those thinking patterns. That can bring you in to take the lids off of your life. And it's already there available for you. And I'm just sharing a few of the things that's going on. And there's many other. For all the seniors that are here, don't ever speak of being retired. They literally tell you the molecular changes that goes on with inside of your system, it actually causes your metabolism and immune system to slow down. I don't, people, this is what's amazing to me is we have never used the word, Kathy and I, retired. And yet I had eight people come to me this week and they say, hey, how are you enjoying retirement? And I'm saying, I, I've, I've never said we've retired. We shifted roles around, but we're not retiring. Come on. And, and, and listen, listen, listen very carefully. This may sound like a, a minor point for all, this, uh, all the uh, seniors that are here, 50 and up. You need to be there Tuesday if at all possible because Kathy and I have been spending one of our exercises of bonding together, amen, is we read to one another. And it's usually her reading to me because I'm a little bit slower, amen. So she reads and then some of the things we're learning about this area is just huge. But again, it's taking the lids off the mindsets of individuals that will bring them into another dimension. Last of all, what are you thinking about to motivate one another? Are you not motivated yourself? Because you'll never motivate someone else until you're engaged. And the church that Pastor R.G. and Mary C. is an engaged church full of love, provoking, motivating one to love, but also to good works. We have one of the largest, they have one of the largest helps supportive role ministries in the entire nation of Canada today. In this church right now, one of the highest. But yet there's still hundreds of individuals that are still not engaged. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why the church they see is going to get into that engagement. You go ahead right in. Amen. And one of the things that I just wanted to point out when we're talking about this love 
It's relationship with others. You know, your Christian life can be most fully realized only in relationship. If you're not in relationship with anyone, who do you have to forgive? <laughs> who can you serve? Come on. It's, it's, in, it's in community that your, your Christian life is most fully realized and all of your gifts actually are activated in relationship in, in the community. But I want you to try this experiment this week. I want you to walk up random people and motivate them to do things for you. So go sit in front of your house or your apartment and try to get someone to wash your car randomly. Try to get someone to cut your grass, rake your leaves, <laughs> cook you dinner. Now you're laughing, why? Because if you don't have any relationship with someone, how successful do you think you're going to be convincing them and motivating them to do something for you? You're going to try it? Good luck. Come on, come on. But see, when you have relationship with someone, wow. out of relationship, you can communicate with people and say, hey, children, how about we all go wash the car together? There's relationship there. Hey, friends, let's go build some community together. Let's go minister to these people together. Let's go have a prayer meeting together. We're motivated by the love that we have out of relationship for one another. Do you see how this works? And good works are a great way to increase in favor with people in the community. I have lots of friends. You know, I think they might still have some peppers out there from first. They, yeah, they, 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 they put out some peppers. My wife and I make a point, if they have extra produce, um, take some and then we just go talk to our neighbors and we share That's with good. our friends. And, and I think I've shared, but even on our street right now, there was one couple and, and uh, they had strawberries one day, so I grabbed some strawberries. Yeah. Went down the street with strawberries. They were nice strawberries, they were great. And, and the one lady came to the door and she just looked stunned. Yeah. And I was like, you gonna be okay? It's just strawberry. Yeah. <laughs> but she had, she had gone to the store and done her grocery shopping, she forgot strawberries and the dessert she was making to have her family over required strawberries. And she's wow. freaking out about this and all of a sudden I show up at the door with strawberries. Wow. <laughs> That's we're awesome. friends now. I can't say the Holy Spirit said, go bring our strawberries, but you know what? Just by activating some good works and serving people, all of a sudden it opens the door for relationship. Okay, and as we engage in relationship with each other and with our community, that's when we gain influence. And when you have influence, you can share faith or people see the faith that you live day in, day out, and then they want what you have. You know you're doing it right when people walk up to you and say, I want what you have. Come on. I think that's the heartbeat of the Christian life. Why don't you all stand with us? And if you didn't grab an element on your way in, please do now. The ushers will help you find one. And you know, when we come to the Lord's table, the communion, that's one of the things that it listed a moment ago that we do together in community. We partake of the Lord's Supper. And in community... What do we do? We operate in forgiveness. It's true. We forgive those that have wronged us. We release offenses. The Bible says when you come to the altar with a gift, you should, if you remember there's aught, you go deal with that before you come to the table. Because at the table, there's freedom and deliverance. Go ahead, Pastor. That's powerful. They were constantly devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the Word of God, to fellowship, not hit and miss, but constantly, and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. This was the DNA. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through them, the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, had all things in common. And Father, as we're here today, I'm just asking that 
there would be such a spirit of engagement that even as my brothers even shared that they, they were isolated. They felt that they're uh, introverts and, and not extroverts of any kind. But Father God, they engaged and now their lives, uh, they just feel different. The wife even noticed it. So, Father, as we partake of the bread today, may we see the church that you see, a glorious church. May we see the church that you see, a united church, a thankful church, a worshiping church, a praising church, an uplifting church, an encouraging church, a strengthening church, a church as a place of refuge, a safe place, but also a church where there's engagement of what it is that you've invested into our lives. And Father God, as we partake of the bread, may any area of neglect in our personal lives, any area of neglect in our soulish life, our mental life, that we've allowed. God, forgive us in your mercy today. And as we partake of the bread, release, Father God, a spirit of engagement back to you in prayer, but back to also the body of Christ as you even admonish the church at Ephesus, you've fallen from your first love, me and one another. Go and do the first works. May that be done for all of us here at WCF. Let's partake of the bread. As we look at the cup, representing the blood of Jesus that was shed for your sin and mine, there's freedom from the curse. There's freedom from bondage. There's freedom from wrong mindsets and wrong thinking patterns. And today, as we come together as one at the Lord's table, Father, I thank you that you're releasing your presence and power in our lives. I thank you, Father, that you've activated faith in our hearts, that healing is flowing through our bodies now, that our minds are restored to peace, and that most of all, you've purchased our freedom from the law of sin and death, and we can be in relationship with you. So today, Father, we purpose to look to you to guide us, to keep us on the path that is right, Help us to be obedient in all that you ask us to do, Lord. And I thank you that together we can accomplish much in your name. Amen. So today, as you've been here worshiping our Creator together, if you need prayer for whatever reason, we'll have some teams down here at the front to pray and activate faith with you and believe God for you. If you're visiting with us and you're our guest today, we'd love to invite you down the hall. God bless you all as you go. Go in peace. Greet your neighbor and have the best week of your life. We'll see you.